Well, good afternoon. This is Jay Waters. I'm with the Americans in Wartime Museum Project, and today is the 25th of August. We're out in Manassas, Virginia. I have Mr. Dave Mattingly with us, and we're going to do an interview. And Dave, if you would just introduce yourself, sure. date of birth, and where, where you were born. Uh, I'm Dave Mad David Mattingly, Dave. Uh, born in Louisville, Kentucky. In And uh, what, what conflicts did you participate in? Well, I joined the Navy at the very end of the Vietnam conflict. The uh, U.S. had signed the peace treaty uh, with Vietnam, actually the day, after, day before my, my birthday. Okay. Uh, but I had had an intention of serving, and uh, the Navy recruiter came to my high school, and uh, I enlisted on May 9th with a delay entry. So I got to spend the summer at home after my high school graduation and then reported uh, to Great Lakes for boot camp on November 1st of 1973. Okay. Wow. Well, and, and, and we'll come back to um, your training, but I understand you've participated in several different conflicts as well over your career. Yes, I, I did. I, uh, I retired in 2005 with a combination of active and reserve time. Uh, during that time, I, I served at in Vietnam during the evacuation of Saigon in April of 1975 on board the USS Midway. Uh, then later uh, was part of the NATO stabilization force that uh, went to Sarajevo after the end of the war there in 1998 uh, and spent six months as part of the NATO command. And then the next year was on board the uh, command ship for Sixth Fleet during the Kosovo uh, operation and then and, uh, after 9-11, I was at Central Command in Tampa, Florida, along with a detachment uh, in San Antonio, Texas, and then our forward headquarters, which was in uh, Qatar, uh, where we kicked off uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. And how many years total service did you have? Total service, 32 years. 32, excellent. So just going back a little bit then, did you have other um, veterans in the family, parents, brothers, sisters, uncles? Yes, my, uh, my father and grandfather and my brother were all Army veterans. Uh, my grandfather was drafted in World War I, my uh, father in World War II, and my brother uh, in Vietnam. And then I had an uncle who was an officer in the Air Force. Uh, my uncle, of course, as an officer, was a volunteer. My brother, grandfather, they were drafted into the Army, they did their time and returned to civilian life. And well, with that, that great history of uh, service in the family, Army and Air Force, then what, what made you pick the Navy? Uh, kind of a funny story. When I was um, in high school, I was the high school photographer. Okay. And the month that the Navy recruiter came to my high school, there was a magazine called Camera 35 and they had a story about how great the Navy's photography school was. So when the Navy recruiter showed up, I said, you guarantee me Navy photography yeah. school and I'll join. Uh, funny thing was after I took the test and he said, I can be whatever I wanted to be. I said, well, I still want to be a photographer. And he looked up in his book and he said, well, I can guarantee you one of three things. I can guarantee you photographer. I can guarantee you photo intelligence man or I can guarantee you engineer's aid, but don't worry. You've been the high school photographer, you'll get photographer. Uh, funny last words. Uh, joined, so I joined get, being guaranteed one of the three and that with it in my mind that I've been the high school photographer, so yeah. I'll get to be a photographer. Uh, after uh, boot camp, we were a couple of weeks from graduating and they were reading the orders to where we were going and I found out that I was being ordered to the Armed Forces Air Intelligence Training Center at Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, Colorado to learn how to be a photo intelligence man, which was a, analyzing the uh, photo reconnaissance from the airplanes and then later on uh, the satellite photography. Right. So you were, you, were, you were still looking at photographs? Yes, I was. So they kind of kept his word? They kept it sort of kind sort of. Sort of. Uh, the nice thing was is after I began training, I found out that I really enjoyed it. Uh, when I got out to the ship, uh, the USS Midway, I found out there were a lot of things that photographers did that I would have hated, like sitting there watching a machine processing 
inches or feet 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 of of aerial reconnaissance film um, and then when we came up for promotion uh, in the Navy you take a test and if you score high enough uh, then you're promoted and it's a Navy wide test so that year they made three third class photo mates in the entire Navy yeah. whereas in my rating as a photo intelligenceman all of us I think a total of about eight that were on the ship that took the test all of us made it so promotion wise it was a much better choice and I could still do photography as a hobby and since the Midway was home ported in Japan I was in camera heaven so yeah uh, so I was going to ask did you did you stay with your photography yes, I did. as a hobby I yeah. have kept it up as a hobby any, over any the years funny stories over the Navy years of, of taking pictures or anything or? Uh, probably the the best was that when when you're at sea and especially back in in the days of the Cold War in the Soviet Union uh, the Soviet used to send uh, fishing trawlers to follow the Navy ships and um, the photographers were more in tune to doing the photojournalism sort of thing so my boss gave me a box of film and said go take your own pictures so I was able to actually do my own photography for my intelligence reports of, of and the Russian ship yeah, right that's all good. So it worked so, out good so I knew what I was wanting to highlight in the report so being the photographer worked yeah, out well no, sure sure we'll change direction for a minute and then we're going to come back to uh, some of your training um, what do you remember about September 11th, where, where you were and, and uh, how you found out the news and just uh, September experience? 11th, I was stationed at uh, the Command uh, Naval Reserve Intelligence Command in Fort Worth, Texas. And I had actually just taken the position on September 8th as the Command Master Chief, as the senior enlisted to a about a 4,500 command of officers and enlisted. And since it was a reserve command and the reservists came in on weekends, we typically would have the Monday and Tuesday off after the drill weekend. So I, uh, in the Navy, when you make chief petty officer, from the time that you're selected until you're uh, pinned on, on or about September 16th, you go through a couple of months of training. So that morning, we had chief's selectee training which meant that we met at about five o'clock in the morning, go out for a run, calisthenics. And so I'd spent the morning uh, in a, a very hot uh, September at uh, uh, Naval Air Station Fort Worth with the chief selects. I uh, had stopped by the gym to do a little bit more uh, PT and had come back to my, my room at the quarters and had just was getting ready to take a shower, turned on the TV and I saw the second plane fly into yeah. the uh, into the tower. Wow. Um, that's that's a that's a good story there too. So I wanted to go back to your your, your training though. So sure. um, just tell us a little bit. You went to Great Lakes training probably initially. Went to Great Lakes initially. Uh, kind of a interesting thing is I've reconnected with my company commander who's retired, uh, first class signalman Tondu and up in Michigan and uh, kind of fun now that we're both out of the Navy to be able to trade stories. Uh, but I went through uh, November, December, uh, they allowed us to go home for Christmas. We were just about ready to graduate. So we came home on Christmas leave, then reported in for the last two weeks and then graduation. Okay, okay. And so that was your, your basic training? That was basic training. And then you went for the specialized training? Then I went to uh, Lowry Air Force Base. Lowry, okay in Denver, Colorado, and it was a combined uh, Air, uh, Armed Forces Air Intelligence Training Center. And there we were in a mixed class of Air Force and Navy learning the, the basic skills to interpret the, the aerial photography. And what year do you think that was? That was, I started school in the um, uh, first part of February of 1974 and graduated uh, at the end of May 74. Uh, yeah, so it was a pretty long course. Yeah. yeah uh, what, what did, you, did you enjoy the course, or was it drudgery? Or? I enjoyed it. Uh, I was scared at the very beginning because uh, talking in the, in the lounge one day, uh, one of the guys uh, said, well, how's your math skills? And I said, no, they're okay. I said, do you know how to use a slide rule? Nope. 
And I remember a slide rule in my physics class in high school, and I never learned how to use it. Yeah. Uh, I walked into the third block, which was the introductory to photometrics, and there was that same slide rule there. The only difference was if you failed out of the school, you went out to sea as a uh, airman pushing airplanes around the flight deck for a living. And if you've ever seen a picture of one of the guys, he's got chains hanging around his neck, and uh, it's not something that I really wanted to do. So I was motivated to learn how to use the slide rule. Sure. Calculators had just come on the scene, but just a basic calculator then was about $90. They allowed us to use them for homework, but you had to use the slide rule for the test. So I learned how to use the slide rule and uh, ended up uh, becoming very proficient in it. I ended up, that was my best block, I think. I, I got a, uh, like 100 on it. So okay. I, uh, and I, I can still use a slide sure. rule. And was that the end of training then? Oh, no, that was, that was about the third block. And then from there, then we learned about the different uh, Russian airplanes, okay. tanks, uh, how a, a army unit looks like on the ground, what the ships look like. Uh, and then our final problem was taking a aerial mission, uh, how you plan it, lay out, and then we're given a, uh, the film at the end and, and did the readouts of how many tanks we saw or how okay. many ships were in port and that sort of okay. thing. Well, you must have been pretty good at it. Uh, I, I like to think I was. Um, and then where was your... After that school, then were you sent to the fleet? or I was, sent, I was sent to the fleet uh, and I... Um, the USS Midway was a, an experiment at the time. She was a, a World War II air. She was uh, commissioned at the closing days of, of World War II. Uh, she saw action in Korea. She was decommissioned uh, to be, so that she could be upgraded, uh, went back into service in Vietnam. She actually has the distinction of shooting down the first MiG and the last MiG of the Vietnam War. Okay, yeah. Uh, but she had been moved to Japan as an experiment. Whenever something happened, the way the story's told is the president always used to ask the question, where's my carriers? And by having a, a forward deployed aircraft carrier, it would cut down the travel time to get to where the action was. Right. So the idea was they were gonna put one in the Pacific and one in Europe. The one in Europe never materialized, but the one in uh, Japan was supposed to be a three year trial. And now I think it's the fourth carrier is there and she, we still have a carrier home port still in there, Japan. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they were putting out calls to people that would like to be part of the crew and I put that down on my dream sheet and I got my choice. I, I went to Japan and uh, reported first part of June of 74. Okay. Well, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the uh evacuation of Saigon in a minute but just over over the years it, 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 it seems you I'm not perfect on Navy ranks but you you got promoted multiple times uh, a lot I, of years of service were there any promotions that really stood out or something interesting on uh, over, over the career there well uh, I think the I had had left active duty after my first tour and I returned to the University of Louisville because my well what I my plans were to uh, use my GI Bill to get my degree and then apply for a commission and go back on active duty. Uh, as I was coming close to graduation, I was coming up for Chief Petty Officer and being a Chief in the Navy is very different than any of the other services and I thought, well, I'll give it a crack and I took the test and I was selected on my, my first time up so I thought, okay, I'm going to see how being a Chief was and I found out that I enjoyed staying a chief, staying enlisted, and so I finished out the rest of my career as a chief. Uh, being a chief, though, at that time, I hit the desert storm period where there was a drawdown and promotions were very slow. So I was really becoming very, uh, 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 just kind of down that I hadn't been selected for a senior chief, the next rank. When I was selected for for uh, senior chief, and I decided that I would do, I wouldn't wait that long for another promotion because I only had one left. 
And uh, the way that I saw to get around that was to go back to sea and get blue water under me. So I volunteered to uh, take a position on the Sixth Fleet, which was at that time headquartered out of a small fishing village in Gaeta, Italy, yeah. and um, became uh, the, uh, the leading chief in their intelligence division, supporting operations in the, the Mediterranean. At that time, the, the, it was at the closing days of the Bosnian War. We were just putting right. uh, putting troops uh, in to support the stabilization force, or before that, the implementation force. So that set me up then for my next assignment uh, with NATO in Sarajevo, Bosnia, as an intelligence officer. And that was a, an eight-month assignment uh, before coming back to the States then. Okay, okay. And one thing about the Sarajevo is that's also where I was selected for Master Chief and so I was pinned by an Army uh, Colonel and a German Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. Wow. So yeah, and that's that, your pinnacle rank. That's, in, in that was my, the highest rank. To, yeah, well, so, so let's just jump right into that. I was going to go Vietnam first, but let's just, so what was your deployment like in addition to getting promoted there? Or, well, um, it, was, sorry, it was very different because I was used to working with Navy units. And not only was I working in a joint environment with the other U.S. forces, but I was also working with all of the different NATO countries. So serving in a multinational command headquarters was, was, uh, was different, where uh, not understanding our rank structure, and for an example, uh, you would never, an, an American officer would never address me by my first name. I would always be called Master Chief. But in the, in the European tradition, the officers called their NCOs by their first name. And so that, just some little nuances that make yeah. the services different. But it was, a, it was an interesting experience. Uh, learned a lot about the conflict that I hadn't realized, some of the, uh, the atrocities that had been uh, committed by all three sides. And um, for that, I think that it, it left a, an important part of, of uh, how I would look at future conflicts when we got onto Iraq. And I, after I retired from the Navy, I did go back to Sarajevo and worked as a DOD civilian at the U.S. National Intelligence Cell there for two years. And um, part of that work led to the arrest of the last of the big war criminals and they've both been convicted at The Hague, and I have some job satisfaction yeah, okay. uh, seeing, that, seeing that they're in prison for the yeah, rest of their like life. Yeah, and Yeah, well, he, he was uh, gone and by the time I came back, yeah. but uh, Bar Bar uh, Melodic and, and Carradage. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I mean, ironically, I'm, I'm reading right now a book that, that kind of tells the whole story of Yugoslavia's destruction, and then the- mm. Oh, interesting. Haven't, yeah, I haven't really gotten to the, the UN involvement because right. they weren't involved. But but during your experiences there, did you get any, like, we had the media perspective, and I remember being attuned to that, but it wasn't covered that closely. Did you get a feeling, though, of what really was going on? Or, or Yeah, I think a, at a lot of times is that all three sides used the media to tell their story the way they wanted their story told. And it was almost as if uh, events took place for their media impact rather than any other strategic or tactical uh, importance, but it was to get world opinion, try to get world opinion on their side. Yeah, and, and did you even see like where they were trying to influence their own people, the Serb atrocities? Yeah, well, or? and yeah, because the, the, uh, the amazing thing about the country is that under Tito, the people lived next door to each other. They intermarried. And it wasn't until Milosevic uh, started his nationalistic furor where all of a sudden your worst enemy was that person who used to be your best friend. Right. Yeah, a Serb or a Croat. Or yep. A, a, a yeah. Albanian, Kosovo. So, yeah. Well, then, so, and we're kind of jumping around, but you also were, were involved in the Kosovo. Uh, right. Conflict. So could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I was on the Sixth Fleet staff again back in, uh, in Italy. And uh, 
After Desert Storm, uh, the Tomahawk missiles became a very important part of the American Navy arsenal uh, because you could, you could launch a missile that was very accurate without risking the pilots having to fly a mission. Uh, so what I was doing was uh, acting as a targeting officer. We had a list of targets that were, had been approved by the president, and then we would look at them for whether they were a better target to be hit by uh, an airplane dropping bombs or whether uh, it was a, uh, a target that a missile would be better for. Uh, sadly, during that time is when we hit the Chinese embassy. Okay. Uh, the Air Force hit that that night, not the Navy. Uh, but Any behind, inside scoop on what was really going I, on there? I really don't want to go into that one okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, for classification reasons. No, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and just, yeah. and just uh, I know that when I had my picture taken from it in 2007, it was still empty, the Chinese embassy. Uh, the hotel that was struck the same morning by the Navy, uh, I had my picture taken in front of it. Uh, at that time was still under reconstruction and it was uh, highlighted in a fr uh, uh, Kevin Costner movie. I think it was called uh, 30 Days to Live or something like that. But and then, it, was this in, in, in Belgrade? That, yes. And, okay. Yeah. So the yeah. So. yeah, we had taken a weekend trip to Belgrade and uh, visited the two locations. Well, and, and I'm going off of memory, but I also kind of recall, I think it was during the Kosovo conflict, we um, inadvertently hit a train, a civilian train. Do you remember that? I believe so, yeah. You, yeah, but, I, don't, don't, have, I okay. don't have any, okay. I don't remember that, yeah. And, yeah, I was going to ask you if you had any insight on... Uh, but what was your overall reflection on the, the Kosovo conflict? Uh, Kosovo, I think, got fueled because of the success that we uh, we found in, in the Bosnian campaign. The one thing that um, we seemed to think that we could win a war by air and in the long run, you can, you can do it to a point, but eventually you have to put troops on the ground. The fact that we still have troops on the ground there that most people have probably forgotten proves that there's still a lot of, thing, a lot of things to work out in, in that part of the world. It seems like things are getting better or we just don't hear about it anymore. I don't think that, I think the Americans are focused on other parts of the world. I have friends in the State Department, like even, even in Sarajevo, there are elections in Bosnia are coming up. And that's, uh, from what I'm hearing, it's going to be an interesting election cycle, which seems like they all are nowadays. Yeah. Well, here's another question, certainly not on the script, but um, David, you might be a good person to, to think about this. Do you see any correlation between, like, the Kurdistan trying to break out of Iraq to how Yugoslavia, uh, when it broke into separate nations, and any thoughts on yeah. comparisons on that? Well, you know, early on, in the Iraq planning, um, I think at that time, Vice President Biden was a congressman and he came up with the idea that you we break it into the three parts. And though it has somewhat worked in Bosnia, I don't think it would work in Iraq uh, just because you would have an area in the south which is very uh, agricultural that could survive uh, you have the Kurdistan that has the oil, and then you have the middle that has nothing but desert. And so trying to work out those three. The other issue with Kurdistan is Kurdistan crosses over from Iraq. It's not just Iraq. Right. So you've got Kurds that live in Iran and Turkey. Sure. So trying to create a Kurdistan, do you, are you ready to go to a civil war in these other two right. countries? Right. No, that's, that's a good point. It just seems like there's some comparisons there is but I don't I don't think it would quite and also because uh, the the people have not are not distinct that you don't have the Shia just living in one area and in Iraq because of the ethnic cleansing though it wasn't that way before 1991 it has become that you don't have really many Muslims that live in what's now the Republic of Srpska and uh, you have it more divided now than you did before 1991 and not like 
you have in Iraq. Right. Um, well, so then let's kind of jump back then to the Vietnam uh, time. And I think you had said, and I saw on your sheet, you were very involved in the, the, the final evacuation of right. Saigon. Can you talk about that a little sure. bit? Sure. Uh, in joining uh, the Navy, the like I said, the Vietnam Peace Treaty was signed just a, a day before my 18th birthday. So I registered for the Vietnam draft. Uh, I think I had a high number that year and didn't have to worry about it. And plus, I was a high school student. Uh, but Vietnam was even pretty much out of the back of our minds. We would get the intelligence reports you know, since we were in the Pacific, didn't really pay much attention to them until uh, really January or so of 1974, which we saw the uh, North Vietnamese armies starting to move down. You, we left, when we signed the treaty, we left the country really set up to, for failure. Uh, we left the North Vietnamese and the, uh, keep their troops in South Vietnam so, and then we were also supposed to be supplying them with weapons, but a lot of things had changed. Nixon uh, resigned. Congress had, had really tightened uh, the, the purse strings on expenditures in Vietnam. So when things turned bad, uh, the ambassador, Graham Martin, at the time, he had been out of touch with the United States for so long. He had been in, in uh, Vietnam that he thought that the cavalry would come. He requested uh, more ammunition, more supplies. Congress wasn't hearing any of it and wouldn't give the money. And especially, we weren't going to reintroduce troops into the war. Right. So we started paying attention because as they moved down, uh, it, the idea was that eventually North Vietnam was going to take over the country. We still had a lot of Americans living and working in uh, South Vietnam, and it was going to be up to the Navy to get them out if the Air Force couldn't do it. Right. Now, the Air Force did a heck of a job. They were flying C-5, C-41s into uh, Tonsonut and bringing as many people as they could out. But Is that the Saigon area? That was from the Saigon area. But as the, as the uh, North Vietnamese were coming down the coast, People were leaving the northern cities, Da Nang, and trying to get to, to uh, Saigon any way possible. They were loading up uh, merchant ships. Uh, there were some contracted airlines that were flying in. There was a famous picture of, a, of an executive of one of the uh, airline companies punching a refugee because the refugee wanted on the airplane and there wasn't any more room. They had to, they had to take off. Uh, so it was just a dire time for the Vietnamese people uh, trying to get down to Saigon, thinking that at least Saigon would be safe, but in, uh, eventually that fell as well. Right. So you, were you then involved in the actual last days of the evacuation yes, it was. of Saigon? Uh, so besides Vietnam falling, uh, Phnom Penh, uh, the capital of Cambodia, Cambodia fell before Vietnam did. So uh, when it fell, the midway, we sat off the coast of Vietnam to provide air cover in the event that uh, things got uh, violent in, uh, in Cambodia. After the evacuation of Phnom Penh, we uh, pulled into the Philippines to, uh, for our normal uh, liberty. After three days in port, we found out we were going back to sea. Instead of going back to sea as a regular aircraft carrier though, we only took a couple of fighters with us and the rest of the air wing stayed in the Philippines. And then we went to, uh, off the coast of Thailand, it's uh, the town Sadaheep, and then had uh, two detachments of Air Force CH-53 helicopters came out to the uh, midway and they were going to be our air wing for the evacuation. Okay. okay. Uh, Something that's different about Air Force helicopters compared to Navy helicopters. Navy helicopters are built so that our rotors can collapse and make room uh, on the hangar decks and flight decks. Air Force lands on land, they don't have to worry about that so their rotors don't collapse. So we ran into an issue that when the evacuation eventually started, uh, the Air Force could only land on the midway or another big deck 
carrier because if they had engine problems and had to go down, if, she had, if the helicopter had landed on a smaller boat, it would have fouled that deck and that ship would have been out of action then. So they would bring the refugees to the Midway. Uh, they would be interviewed, uh, their documentation, visas, uh, passports collected, searched uh, for weapons, and then they would be put on Navy helicopters and moved to another oh, ship. Okay. So the Navy helicopters did more of the back and forth between the ships, whereas the Air Force and uh, the larger Marine helicopters would fly actually into Saigon to pick up, pick so up the you, refugees. you were almost a, a subway collection point. Exactly. Everybody comes in and then they get on smaller, out to the suburbs. Or just yeah, to exactly. The, and what would, uh, David, what was your specific role during this? What were well, you doing? I was uh, a uh, third class intelligence specialist, a petty officer. And as the pilots were coming back from missions, the air intelligence officers would debrief them. We would try to locate whether they had seen any uh, uh, anti-aircraft fire, if uh, reports from up uh, of the refugees coming, if they knew of other Americans. And then I would take that information, plot it, so that the pilots that were making return trips would know what areas to avoid that might have anti-aircraft fire, as well as uh, with the Americans, we could try to figure out if we would be possible to, to do a mission in to pick them up. Yeah, so it was a it was a tactical operation, but it was also a humanitarian. Yes, event yeah. at, at the same time, right? And you were doing. And both. originally, when the uh, evacuation started, the code signal was playing "White Christmas" over Armed Forces radio really? service, and that was to let everybody know that they needed to be at a pre-designated site okay. for a bus to pick them up to bring them to the embassy. And uh, excuse my ignorance, but this was not Christmas time, so. No, this was in April, so it yeah, wasn't so wasn't Christmas time. So if they played White Christmas, that was your 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 warning your signal, code, the, your signal to come to get to a designated yeah. point. Uh, it, no, no, go ahead, please. Well, the uh, the evacuation, like I said, had been done by the Air Force for uh, several days or weeks before they were flying in the larger airplanes, but. Uh, about April 27th or so, uh, the Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese had fired uh, rockets into the airfield, putting uh, nice craters in the uh, uh, field so that you couldn't bring a C-5 or C-141 yeah. uh, well, fixed in wing. Intentional. Intentionally, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to force us into using the helicopters. So. When we went to the helicopters, there were designated places where we could fly the helicopters in, the embassy being one, but also Tonsonut and some other uh, American offices around the, the city. And did the North Vietnamese target the helicopters? or They, did they... they didn't. They, they, um, they really let everything run its course for about 36 hours. Uh, Graham Martin did not want to leave the country. It took um, uh, Henry Kissinger to uh, compose a message to the commander, who then passed it to a helicopter pilot, and a Marine, uh, I believe it was a Marine major. They landed at the embassy and said, we have orders from the President of the United States, you are to be on this helicopter. And that, that was the ambassador? That was the ambassador. Okay. And he, like I say, he did not want to leave the country, but eventually did. But is it your belief that during that 36 hours, if the North Vietnamese had wanted to engage the helicopters? Most definitely. They could have engaged the helicopters. They could have engaged uh, you know, by throwing um, uh, small mortars, RPGs sure. into the embassy compound. They could have done whatever they wanted. Uh, we had a very small uh, landing force of Marines that came in to uh, back up the um, the Marine security guards that were at the embassy, but um, well outnumbered. They could have easily, and sure. it was not, but probably a, an hour or so after the last helicopter took off that the tanks rode onto the presidential uh, palace area and it was all over. And this this 36 hour was, it wasn't any kind of formal agreement. It was no. just no. impromptu, yeah. like, but you knew you were gonna run out of time. Right. So, and then how about the dramatic 
pictures that we've seen in like Time magazine of the last rooftop helicopters? What was what was well, really going that on there? That picture uh, was taken at a um, intelligence site that was uh, by the CIA, a place called Newport. A lot of people think it's on the top of the embassy, but it's actually at this other location. Okay, so it's not the embassy. No. See, I always thought it was the embassy. Yeah, it, too. it was called Newport. It was a CIA uh, building. Uh, and the CIA did participate. Uh, great book, if you're interested in history, uh, called, uh, shoot, I forget the name of it. Uh, uh, it's written by Frank Snepp, uh, A Decent Interval. And it, essentially, and it was taken from a speech that Henry Kissinger, I believe, had made about that there would be a decent interval, which the time between we left until the country fell. Uh, and Frank was a uh, senior intelligence analyst at the embassy with the CIA, uh, which he left the, left the agency and is a journalist now. Uh, but uh, I think that there was a time that it, it both that everybody knew it was coming and by their own kind of wink or nod that we had enough time to do to do the uh, evacuation and one of the the stories that's that's uh, not told often uh, you saw the helicopters coming out to the fleet but you didn't really see any of the fixed wing that's because there was only one. Okay. Most of the people that knew how to fly a fixed wing airplane flew to bases in Thailand. Okay. But there was one uh, Vietnamese Air Force uh, major who decided to take his two-seater observation aircraft, uh, an O-1 Bird Dog. It's actually a movie in a movie with uh, Gene Hackman uh, flying one. Uh, uh, bat bat, bat twenty one. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this. Uh, Major put his wife and his five children in the airplane and instead of flying to Thailand he flew out to the fleet and he started circling the midway and everybody's you know is this guy a kamikaze is he gonna what's he gonna do well, somebody noticed he was throwing something out of the window but a piece of paper being thrown out of a window well he threw something else out and it turned out it was his pistol holster and it landed on the flight deck one of the crewmen opened it and he had written a note out of the, he had torn a page wow. out of his uh, wow. flight book, and he had written in the border, I can land on your airfield if you move your, those airplanes. One hour of fuel, please save us, Major Buong, wow. wife, and five children. Wow. And the captain of uh, the ship was fairly new. He came on board in January, and this was his first trip taking the ship out of Japan. So he's been in command for four years, or four months. And he called the, the air boss, which is the, the officer that's in charge of the flight deck and all the air operations, and asked him if he thought we could do it. Said, Won't know until we try it. So we had a couple of Chinooks and about four Hueys that were on our uh, aft portion of the runway, the flight deck. And we, they ordered it, we pushed those off the side. Okay, yeah. Uh, to make room for the, the landing. Uh, because we didn't have a full air wing, we had plenty of room down below. So we were storing a lot of the helicopters that came on board compared to the smaller ships, the amphibious ships, the destroyers that had room for maybe one or two helos. So as soon as somebody landed, they had to th throw that uh, helicopter over the side to make room for the next one. And then they also had helicopters that were coming in that were afraid to land on a ship because they've never done it before, that were just crashing into the uh, water near the ship and having a, a whale boat or oh, pick them up. they didn't want to damage the they, ship. They didn't, the they, not necessarily the damage it, but they just didn't trust themselves to be able to land there. And they figured it'd be safer to just land in the water. Ditch it in the, and they thought that was safer. They uh, thought it was safer. So what there do you were. Think? Is that uh, if I had never landed on a carry or on a small boat before, I think I probably would have taken the water. Mm. Okay. But, but 
But back to the, uh, so the, we, the Vietnamese yeah. pilot. Yeah. So we pushed the, uh, the, the uh, helicopters off the stern, made way to clear path for him. He came in and did his one and only aircraft carrier landing. He landed, we opened up the airplane, and yeah, he had seven people in a two-seater. Uh, wow. uh, the, the plane was boxed up. It's now on display at the uh, National Naval Air Museum in Pensacola, Florida. Yeah. Uh, for the 35th anniversary of the fall of Saigon, Major Bong, his wife, his children, and their grandchildren were on board the Midway, which is a museum now in San Diego. Uh, the captain, who was a retired rear admiral, Lawrence Chambers, the air boss, who is a volunteer on the Midway, were all there for the wow. 35th anniversary. And wow. uh, you think that this whole group, this not just the seven that we rescued, but all their grandchildren wouldn't yeah. be here if the captain hadn't made that decision. Yeah, so he made the right decision. Yeah. And then he said, let's try, or the air boss said, let's try. Yeah. And so have you ever met any of these people? Uh, I Actually, I met the air boss the day that the museum opened in 2004. Uh, he was up in Katzi telling that story yeah. to a newspaper and uh, ended the newspaper and interviewed both of us that day then about the evacuation. Yeah. And you were there. That and was, I was there. Yeah, because yeah, I've seen footage of the helicopters and, and maybe other things being pushed off the, there but, is, but off the air, off your aircraft carrier, but also off of the smaller boats, yep. the small boats. Yeah. Okay. Because we had a just didn't have room, right? Yeah, you didn't have room. Uh, we uh, we in, those were the only ones that we pushed off, uh, yeah. but there were a lot more pushed, and they were the ones we pushed off uh, because maintenance standards uh, were not as high as ours. People said, why did you push off a million dollar airplane? Well, these were ready for the junkyard. They weren't yeah. in the best shape. It wasn't like pushing one of ours off. Yeah, that must have been a tough decision though for the, oh, yeah. the captain. Yeah, he because could be, if- He could be criticized and second guessed. If that, if that helicopter, or excuse me, if that 01 bird dog had skidded, had burst into flames, had caused a fire on board ship, uh, the casualties, could have well turned into a catastrophe, yeah. but- yeah. Uh, he had a, the guy was a skilled pilot and uh, he landed. Oh, he had some precious cargo on oh, the Oh, yeah, plane too, yeah. So. Now, after the evacuation was over, uh, we had to return the Air Force helicopters back to Thailand. And then the uh, fixed wing, the A-37s and F-5s that had been flown over to Thailand, uh, they put them on slings uh, with the helicopters, brought them back, okay. filled our flight deck full of F-5s and A-37s, and then we took those over to uh, Guam and then offloaded those in Guam. I guess the Air Force might have been mad if you pushed their... Yeah, their I don't think they would have liked it. And yeah. we didn't push any of the uh, the Air America, the CIA helicopters. They okay. were all in beautiful shape, so we, we didn't, uh, didn't want to hurt any of theirs. David, did you have any experiences where you were like personally shot at or missiles or something like that happened to I, where you were? I was very lucky as a sailor. I never uh, never was. Uh, in Bosnia, we had our biggest threat there were the landmines. Landmines, yeah. uh, I uh, was taught not to walk on anything unless it was hard. I, after my retirement, I returned to DOD as a civilian though and spent uh, two more years in Bosnia and three more years in, in Iraq. And during my Iraq time as a civilian, I did get shot at. So you, you, it, you did. it was strange that I would serve so many years in uniform and never be involved in direct somebody shooting at yeah. me combat. Well, what happened as a civilian in Iraq? Well, I, uh, I had signed on as an intelligence uh, analyst uh, at the Joint Detention Center at Abu Ghraib Prison oh, oh, wow. after the pictures were taken. Uh, but on April 2nd, 2005, uh, we had three truck bombs drove up to the front gate, uh, exploded. Uh, we had um, the Marines at that time were on the uh, guard force on the wall. Okay. Uh, we, and then we went under attack for about four and a half hours of small arms, uh, RPGs, mortars, rockets. I think there were 32 Marines that were hurt that day. Uh, none were killed. And uh, from the 
uh, photographs from outside the wire, uh, we did a lot more damage. Sure. Uh, the idea was that they were going to break break out the wall and then break, be able to break into the each. It wasn't one big prison. There were multiple camps. Some of them from a minimum security, just having uh, a fence around them to the the harder sites that were in the pictures where it was actually a prison. So their idea was at least they could get in far enough to break out the uh, the soft sites. Okay. Uh, I was there for, for six months and then came back to the States, went to work for the Department of Justice, and then uh, later on then went back with the intelligence directorate in Baghdad. And I was a senior analyst uh, with the J-2 in Baghdad. Okay. Okay. Were there any other conflicts or area of combat that you, or, or something else in any of those areas that you wanted to hit on? Uh, not really combat because I, I think we've hit those pretty much. Uh, the, I think uh, one of the interesting times to be in Navy intelligence during my career was the, uh, the 80s, around 84, 85, which was the year of the spies when we had the Johnny Walker spy oh, yeah, cases, yeah. which impacted Navy intelligence. And um, I think that was a, a, a big awakening of what our security was from the inside. Yeah, and how we police ourselves or, or, exactly. or blind spots, internal right. threats. Yeah. So back then, it was as easy to update your clearance if you were like Johnny Walker, go to a stamp shop in Norfolk and buy a rubber stamp and stamp the sheet, superstitiously put it in your record, and you were good for another five years of your investigation. Yeah, and I that's what did that, yeah. that's what forced us into a central adjudication center so that everything is kept in one place and you can't update your own clearance. Right. right. Um, well, so whether during the Vietnam or, or up to up into Kosovo, uh, anything stand out about how you stayed in contact with family and friends back in the U.S.? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, when I first went in and and over the years, it was an occasional phone call, but more importantly, it was the mail. Uh, being on an aircraft carrier, at least we got regular mail yeah. usually. Uh, nothing, and no better sound was to say uh, uh, when they would call out that there was a uh, cod on the ball with mail, which a cod is a carrier on board delivery airplane, a small uh, cargo plane, and on the ball meant it was coming in for a landing. And that meant in it that it had mail on board. Okay. So when it landed, uh, then there was a working party to get the mail down, get it sorted by sure. division, and and then your mail petty officer went down to pick up the division's mail, and hopefully that you had that letter from home. You got something now. Um, and then from there, you know, with the electronic age of uh, email, uh, everything being done electronically, very rarely getting a letter. And uh, you know, mail became more of a package that you were getting a package, not necessarily a letter. Uh, and also, the same time was the entertainment change, because on board ship, uh, you would usually get 16 millimeter movies from the, the the movie companies provided them to the military at no charge, as I understand it, uh, to uh, be shown on the ships and stations, and so you. You would have, when we were at sea, a uh, crew would have a movie, the officers would get a movie, so forth. So that was your entertainment. You also, TV shows, we always got, uh, the Super Bowl was two weeks late. Uh, same way with, you know, ball games. Uh, on oh, board, even the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. On, you, everything was delayed a couple yeah, no, of weeks. no digital satellite. Being yeah. it. I think nowadays they probably do. Oh, they do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, on board ship, Usually at 1600, 4 o'clock, uh, ship's TV would come on. And they would show uh, tapes received from the different uh, TV shows back in the States. I remember when Saturday Night Live first came out, and we thought that was the strangest show. Uh, but it was fun. Uh, but uh, And then it would go off at midnight. So that was your entertainment. And being in Japan, uh, Armed Forces Network hadn't gotten 
to Japan yet. Okay. So that was one of the issues when we first got there was that the families didn't have the typical entertainment that they were used to. They would bring the, the families would come on board the base for um, Saturdays, say, to do shopping, and they would drop off their kids at the base theater and they'd watch cartoons all morning while their parents did the grocery shopping. Uh, but now the 16 millimeter movies are gone. Everybody's got CDs with all the movies on it. So entertainment on board the ships has changed from when I first entered. Yeah, Manhattan. but I bet it's more individualized too. People in their bunks. Or oh yeah, exactly. Whereas it, it used to be. It used to be the, the group or the chief's group yep. or the petty, uh, the, the officer of yep. boardroom or whatever, whatever you called it. But they were there collectively together. Yeah, exactly. And now it, it became more of you're watching it on your laptop and on your phone. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, and that was the question about uh, entertainment and theater. Did you, did you, ha uh, you talked about the movies. Did you ever have any USO shows or we did. show up, anything like uh, that? We did have uh, the USO shows come on board. And sometimes they were uh, arranged by somebody on the ship. Frank Sinatra was touring the Far East in August of 1974, and the journalist that ran the ship's TV station went to the captain and said, hey, is it okay if I... Uh, if I go up to talk to Frank Sinatra, do you think would you let me bring him on the ship? And the captain thinking like this guy's got a chance in hell of getting Frank Sinatra to come down here and do a show. Well, he went to Tokyo. He got in to talk to Frank Sinatra's uh, uh, manager, and we had Frank Sinatra come on board. And if you've seen the movies or whatever, when a a dignitary comes on board the ship, he's what we call bong, his bells are rung, yeah. and they will announce who it is. Usually if it's the commanding officer of a ship, they'll use that ship's name, or they'll just say his rank, like Admiral arriving. So that day it was Oak Blue Eyes arriving. So, and, and, did he, and he did a show? And he did a show, he brought um, uh, Shecky Green, a comedian, and I, there was one other act, but I can't remember who it was. That's great. Um, any medals, citations, unit awards that, that, that stand out for you that you received or your unit received? You know, received? Uh, I've gotten them over the years and the awards that I've gotten, the Navy and all the military has gone into a, a I think a medal, into your tour you get a medal if you did your job. And I didn't do anything in my term, I received medals, meritorious service, Good, uh, good conduct, achievement medals. I didn't receive any type of the uh, bronze star, silver star, any, I'd never, I won't call myself a hero. Uh, I think that the awards that we, uh, that my unit got the Viet, after Vietnam, that we received the Navy unit accommodation, I think those mean more to me than anything else that I, that I was awarded. Yeah, for the contributions yep. that you're, you and the team. Yeah, that, no, that's good. That's good. Um, so, and you're a good candidate for this question too, kind of like the keeping in touch. What about your homecomings when you when you came back uh, from the different deployments back to family and friends over the year over the different eras? You know that that changed too. Yeah. Um, now, in, in, in the beginning, because I was home ported overseas and I was single, uh, didn't really have, and we were in and out so much, we, we would pull out of Japan, usually for the longest four months. Uh, so we didn't have this, the big homecomings you see when a ship goes away out for a year that you have back in the States. Coming back from Iraq at, uh, after we had won the war in 2003, uh, that was really special. Uh, something that I do as a um, in my spare time is I'm a guardian for honor flights that come into the Washington area and what I do is meet the airplane. Uh, I'm tied with Chicago and a few other cities where I meet them uh, when they land at Dulles or National Airport and then I spend the day with a veteran as they go and visit their memorials and I've found that to be really worthwhile and to see the emotion uh, especially from the Vietnam veterans they they arrive at the airport yeah it's uh, 
it's, it's just, it, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that too. When I worked at Arlington Cemetery, we would right. see and those we, guys. In fact, when we get done, I'd like to get some contact information sure. from you because yeah. I could do some of that too, especially at National Airport. It's right. just down the road from me. Well, and, and so we actually kind of glossed over your time in Iraq. Um, what stood out about that, that deployment? Uh, I think that the the thing that's, well, from when I was at Central Command and we were planning to go in and the war uh, started and for me sitting in the intelligence center in Qatar was hearing the the first report that we'd lost our first service member and though it might sound crazy I, I thought to my mind was there anything I could have done and there really wasn't uh, that I personally could do but uh, I look back and think of things that in the planning of it on the bigger picture uh, that could have been done uh, that would have made maybe the war more successful gotten us in and out quicker and not gotten us into the quagmire that we're, we're yeah. in now. Yeah, because in fact 2003 was the, was the beginning of, yeah. of, of OIF. And yeah, I actually have a a ball cap that I bought in uh, the Tampa at uh, McDill Air Force Base uh, BX that said Operation or Iraqi Freedom Victory 2003. And as we well know, it was only a month late after I bought that hat that we were sending uh, a command element back overseas when we had come back thinking, oh, the war is over. Yeah, right. we, we shut down the forward headquarters. Everybody's coming home. Yeah, no, that's... Uh some tough times. Yeah. Uh, well, we're we're kind of wrapping up, and we we've been all over the place. Yeah. This has been a great uh, a great interview, though. So here, here's one of the um, well, two two questions towards the end. What about the just your overall wartime experience? How do you think that's affected you, especially like now, and and your your non military career? Although you've been very closely affiliated with the military um, the whole time, it seems like. I think that uh, because of my experiences in Bosnia and with the, the refugees from Vietnam, I look at uh, things somewhat differently than people who've never left the United States, uh, especially on the issue of, of, of immigrants. Uh, I look at the what these other nationalities are they're coming here for, the reasons they're coming here. Uh, I had a neck operation in 2014 in Northern Virginia and my anesthetist was a Vietnamese doctor and I looked at her and I asked her, when did your family come to the United States? She was in one of the last fixed wing airplanes coming to the United States. Wow. So I look at it as these people are coming here for a reason and the reason is for our freedom. And I can't argue against that. And if they want to come here and I look at the contributions that they have to give to the United States, I can only say, come, we are the land of the free. And that's a good perspective. And meeting, meeting somebody from the, like a second generation, maybe she was a child or her parents. Yeah, she was a child yeah, at the time. Yeah. Wow. And the neck operation worked out, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, as we're wrapping up, is there one thing that you would want, if you have children or grandchildren, that you would want them to know about you and your, your, your military service, your wartime service? I've got a daughter, and she put up with a lot. Um, she saw me come and go. Uh, she had a, uh, a map on her wall where she could put a pen when I sent her a letter telling her where I was. Uh, she's now 27. Mm -hmm. You're a PhD candidate. Wow. And I want her to know, and I think she knows, what I did, why I did it, 
and what it means to her now. And I think it took her a few years to get to that, but I think she knows now. And I think she, when she, if or has children, I think she'll, she'll tell them a good story about her dad. Well, good. And you can give her a copy of this interview if you, oh. if you choose to. If, if you choose to, I would love to. It's certainly up to you. Um, well, then the, the last question is is kind of the the throwaway. Is there is there anything else you you wanted to, to cover or retouch on or that we didn't address? Um, the only thing I really is that though my my brother and my my dad and uh, my grandfather even my great 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 something grandfather that served in the revolution um, though they all entered the military in different ways than I did they all served when their country called well, as did you David yeah. well we're gonna shut this off in a second um, I like to do this while we're still on camera though oh. we're gonna we're gonna thank you Thank you very and much. Give you our, our coin and maybe just hold it up to the camera a little bit over oh. that way. There we go. And flip it around. Oh, yeah, it might help. <laughs> but um, as we wrap up on this, this day in August out in Manassas and just great interview, and we all over the place, my notes are covered, and uh, this was a lot of fun. Oh, so, uh, glad. Thank you for doing thank this you. with us.